Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma, Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. And the truth that is Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor. That's Dr. Michael Rice. Today is Memorial Day Celebration 129, and what that is is doing something in our life that will to remove or to work on getting rid of something in us that is of some form of hostility or fear. This is to create a critical mass to bring peace on the planet. We're doing this in in memory of and in honor of all of those who have served and just to try to make a shift and a change from being a war-based planet and country to having peace, what God originally designed it to be. Our call-in number is 646-200-4169. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you on your comments or your questions. And Dr. Tim, I see that you're on with me now. How are you doing today? Quite well, thank you. Good. So uh, is Michael delayed? He is delayed. So he'll be with us here very shortly. But um, We had some comments on some people that weren't able to join us on the show yesterday, and they really appreciated all of the comments and the suggestions and things that you had brought forth. And and said that they enjoyed listening to the show. So that was good. Are those in private emails to you or people in the chat? Yeah. No, they were private emails to me afterwards. They weren't able to join us in the chat room or on the show, and they just went back and picked up the archives of it and listened to it. And they said that, you know, they really enjoyed it. And, you know, especially being able to, you know, the, the comments about being able to hold Love Active been faced with something that appears to be insane. You know, we talked about a lot of things yesterday that be classified as insanity in the world right now. And that's a challenge for all of us to be able to get to the space where we can just hold love, conscious, active, and present regardless of what's going on in our space. Well, and it's it's a, an enormous challenge. I might even say without the proper tools, it's impossible. But with the tools... Absolutely and the support that you can get from a community of one or more people, it's entirely possible. And uh, we just had our group again last evening, Tuesday nights. We have our Mind Shifters group in Crystal Lake. How did that guy share with us? Well, it went beautifully. I think uh, the one thing I wanted to talk about today, if we had the time, was the, um, the depth that's possible and how every single issue whether it seems small or it seems enormous, if I keep working on it, if if I use the tools and I have the willingness to see what it has to offer me, I can keep going back to the same issue or the same worksheet at different levels and get even more out of it. And um, we had uh, a discussion, a very lively discussion, after the video. We were watching the newest version of why is this happening to me again with you and Michael both in the video. And the discussion afterwards was so lively that it took a while near the end of the meeting we had to say, okay, let's let's review a worksheet that happened last week. And I'd mentioned this worksheet on the uh, on the Internet show because it was so powerful for this woman. 
she had a sister who was refusing to talk to her, and she felt she was being isolated and and disrespected by her sister. And she felt as though she was getting the message from her sister that she doesn't belong in the family. And by the time she had done the worksheet and canceled the goal she had for her sister to love her unconditionally and respect her, and said a little prayer and went inside and asked for help from her higher power to see the hidden parts of her mind that were actually causing the pain, she had two flashes of memories. One was a a time when her father told her, you know, everything was going along pretty good in this family until you were born. And another was a memory of going through her mother's belongings after her mother died and finding a card that her mother sent apologizing to her father for not having a boy when this woman was born. So these two very traumatic events came up in her memory. And she was able to see by the end of the worksheet how what her sister is choosing to say and do is not causing her pain. It's simply resonating a deeper pain and a deeper feeling of disconnection from her family. And it's stirring up in her her own belief that there's something wrong with her and she's not lovable. And that was very powerful last week. Most of that processing last week happened after the group. So I asked her to share that this week in the group. And she was willing to do that. And so we stepped through the worksheet process again, all the key points. And she was able to explain to the group how she felt at this point and what was coming up for her. And when she got down to the last part, for the third or fourth time in the worksheet process, she was moved to tears again, and we asked her to breathe, and everybody was supporting her with breathing and sending love. And she got a whole new level of insight. And the new level of insight was that all of her sisters have also been raised in this hurtful, wounded, disrespecting family atmosphere and that they're all just playing out this multi-generational family pattern of attacking each other, not feeling good enough, fighting for position and approval from people who are not coming from a space of love. And so she was able to see her sister as being very much caught in the same pattern of woundedness and defensiveness as she is. And this brought some more tears and some more clarity. And, of course, because we keep track of these things as we're doing worksheets, several margin notes which will lead to other worksheets. So my offering is I've heard Michael say on a number of occasions, keep your worksheets put them in a three-ring binder, date them, number them if you like to number them, but go back to them occasionally or categorize them according to the issues of anger or issues with dad or issues with my boss. And they can become a whole separate support team for you. They can become your best friend because in going back to them and reading them, you can see how much progress you've made. And by going back to them and reading them like this woman did last night, you can get a a whole different level of insight to either that same issue or a whole different issue. And it can open you up to be able to do additional worksheets. It can open you up to new insights from the old worksheets that you did. And so, again, it was a wonderful evening. People got a lot of important questions. One of the things that happened in the... uh, in the new video, is that Michael made the statement, originally you'll do worksheets on any form of difficult interaction that left you with hostility or fear. And then he said, eventually you'll start doing worksheets on your happy times and your happy interactions with people. Do you remember him saying that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have done a few of those. Um, I've not gotten to the point where I'm done with all of my negative stuff yet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a different situation when you look at, you know, because we, 
we don't think of that being an issue. We always think of things being negative or painful that are issues that we need to work through. But anything that we think causes anything in us. So if we say, you know, oh, my husband makes me so happy or, you know, our trip to, you know, Timbuktu was just awesome, I was thrilled. You know, anything that we think makes us anything, whether it's, you know, happy, joyful, pleased, whatever, then we're we're putting the power outside of us instead of inside of us. And so doing the worksheet on that and saying, no, you know, I'm happy because, you know, I'm I have happiness. just happy. <clears throat> right. But then I what have... will come up out of those worksheets is the realization that we've experienced happiness or joy or whatever when something happens and it triggers it. And so it's, I'm not sure how to word this, but it's like a – um, it's almost like a, an addiction or something, you know, that, okay, to, to feel this level of happiness of whatever, I've got to go shopping or, or whatever. Right, and, or, I, or I have to be around my partner. Right. Or I have to have And then what my... happens is that when something happens that that partner's not there or you can't go shopping or whatever, then what happens to the happiness? Right. And so those kind of worksheets will bring that stuff forward that perhaps we don't look at sometimes because we think, oh, well, that's a good thing, you know. I'm with my partner, and we're doing something. We're out to dinner and to a movie, and I'm happy. I'm pleased. But it sort of falls into that, like, a um, looking for approval or looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. Yeah, it's it's all about creating a codependent relationship. Anytime I think anybody else is responsible for or controlling my emotions or reactions, I've instantly created a codependent relationship. So it makes me so happy when my wife does this. It, it it makes me so proud when my kids say this or do this. When I formulate the statement in that way, it means there's a belief in me that says their actions or lack of actions created my pride or my happiness or my satisfaction. And then, as you said, when they're not there to do that or when they do something differently, by extension, my belief is saying, now I'm sad, now I'm disappointed, now I'm angry because of what they just did. And this is Or didn't do. <laughs> or didn't do. And this is all part of the same, it's two sides of the same coin. The process of believing that someone else is responsible for what's going on inside of me, whether it's positive or negative, is putting myself in a prison. It's hiding my power. And what's my power? My power comes from the fact that the truth is my reality is strictly internal, it's unique to me, and is created out of my own thoughts. And if I blame somebody else for what I'm experiencing, I'm hiding the fact that I, I actually created it. So that, that statement that Michael made in that video, in this version of the video, really stirred things up for people and it went all the way it went all the way to questioning how and why it's a bad thing to think that I love this person more than I love that person I need this from somebody more than I need that from somebody it really really stirred up and animated the conversation and it was a it was a wonderful group a lot of energy, a lot of people trying to work at questioning old beliefs and old conclusions, which, of course, is a, ne a necessary prerequisite to being able to learn anything new. If I'm going to learn anything new, I must approach a situation with the assumption that what I already think I know is either only partially true or completely false. If I go into a situation thinking, I already know there, everything there is to know about my emotions, or this situation, or sadness, or forgiveness, then I will not allow any new information or any new conclusions or any new connections to arise within me. So that, that goes along with when you were talking about pulling up the old worksheets. It's the same thing, you know, if we think, oh, well, I've, I'm done with that situation. You know, I did a worksheet on it. I'm finished with it. But if you go back, you know, and allow 
the space to, you know, as you're looking at it, going back over it, then it, like you said earlier, it can just bring forward, you know, new worksheets. Another thing that I've done too is like a lot of times when I've done the, a lot of the seven step worksheets, then just to flip into doing the long form, which we only teach that during the teacher's training now, but just to flip to a different form. I mean, it's still walking you through the forgiveness process. It just takes you a little bit deeper. And to me, that's a big eye opener too, to go to a different worksheet. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I like the longer form worksheet because, as Carrie from uh, Carrie, Illinois, said a couple weeks ago, it's more specific about each of the steps. And it's a really good reminder about how my mind-body energy system works. And each time I read all of those different steps, I'm chipping away at the old conditioning that the culture and my family gave me, which said other people make me happy, other people make me sad, other people hurt my feelings, other people make me angry, other people offend me. And when I read through the long form, there are eight or nine different steps that remind me if I'm in pain, I'm in error. If I'm feeling any form of hostility or fear, my mind has just used faulty data to create a reality in my mind, and on and on. And if you if you review your old worksheets and you have somebody there to support you and they can be listening from the outside, they're likely to be able to hear things that give you a whole new perspective on the worksheet that you did that you think was finished. And that's exactly what happened last night. We had several people catching, as she read through her worksheet, different things she didn't really hear her herself saying. That's awesome. I had a, a, a phone call earlier today from a lady who attended at the Ruoff Center, and she was saying that she really wished the support group would get started up there because she said it's real close to her house and she just is anxious to have that support of other people as she's doing worksheets to be able to do just what you said, to be able to see it from the outside, whereas she's seeing it just with a sort of like with blinders on. And that's a that's one of the great things about this Internet show, the worksheet process itself and the Mind Shifters group. If I write it down, you know, David is always saying, put the pen to the paper. Make the commitment to do one, two, or five worksheets a day. When that happens, instead of hiding things from myself inside my mind, I get to hear them, I get to see them, and I get to get feedback from other people about stuff that I say that I'm not even aware of. An example is earlier in the day, today, I had someone come into my office and start talking about a problem, and he said, well, I got a, a, a chance to get away. It was nice to go to this place, get away from business for a while. I had a lot of thoughts about this issue that was bothering me, but it didn't really affect me. But it's driving me crazy that these <laughs> thoughts keep coming back. And I had to stop him and say, I really wish I had this session videotaped so so you you would know that what I'm about to say back to you actually happened. But do you realize you just said, I'm having a lot of thoughts about this and it's not really bothering me, but it's driving me crazy that these thoughts keep happening. <laughs> and you know you're chuckling because you've seen it you know we all do this I've done it <laughs> right we, we all do this this is why at the intensives in uh, in Missouri at Heartland they frequently play the game responsibility communication or um, regulatory peach the regulatory speech or regulatory peaches game and we give people permission in in the intensive to catch us, interrupt our speech, and point out to us when we make a crazy statement like that. It's a crazy-making statement. And only by giving people permission to do that or writing down your own thoughts in journaling or filling out the worksheets and actually letting the pen hit the paper do you get to see some of the goofy stuff 
that your mind does automatically. You know, I, I talk to people in my work with him even before I met Michael, about how there's a part of my mind that believes it's protecting me and it's always scanning for whatever I'm thinking and feeling. And when it determines that what I'm feeling is too intense, it grabs a hold of it, takes it out of my conscious awareness and says, don't worry about this, Tim, we'll hide it from you. It's made a determination that whatever thoughts Whatever beliefs, whatever images are happening to me in that moment are either too scary, too painful, making me too angry, making me too overwhelmed or confused. And it literally takes my own mental energy and hides that from me in the unconscious. It's made the decision that if I had full awareness of this event or the beliefs I hold about it or my emotions that come from my thoughts, I would be overwhelmed, that I, it would drive me crazy, or the pain would be too much to bear. And this happens dozens of times a day. It's the mechanism that creates the content in my unconscious mind. So what this means is, the older I get, the more times I've done this, every time I do it, I take mental energy and use it to hide from myself my own thoughts, my own experiences, my own memories. Well, it takes my own, my own mental energy. So when I was, you know, 12 or 18 or 25 years old, I had more energy than I know what to do with. So I could create all of these things and stuff them in my unconscious and use my mental energy to hide them from me. But now that I get older, when I hit 35 or 45 or 55 years old, I don't have as much energy as I used to. And now I've got more and more and more of these instances where that, quote, protective part of my mind, the part that thinks it's protecting me, has taken my own awareness, my own memories, my own beliefs, and hidden them, actively hidden them from me in my unconscious. And every time that happens, I create another part of my mind that says, you don't want to know the truth. You can't handle the truth. You remember that movie, A Few Good Men? Right. The Marine movie where Jack yeah. Nicholson was screaming from the stand, you can't handle the truth. I literally create another part of my mind with a little Jack Nicholson in it, and every <laughs> time I get close to that part of my mind, it screams at me, you can't handle the truth, and it shuts it down. And so it's taking my own mental energy to create that guardian and to create that little pocket of my experience and my beliefs and hide it from myself. But so then I have, you find that the more and more worksheets you do then, the easier it is to catch this, to, to see yourself doing this, whereas a lot of times, you know, we're not even aware, like the gentleman that was in your office, not even aware that he did it. But the more and more you do this work, the easier it is to catch yourself and go, oh, look what I just did, or look what I just said. or Exactly. It's easier to catch it, and every time I open up one of those little boxes in my unconscious, even though there's a part of me screaming at me, you can't handle this, run away, it's too much, I prove to myself I can see what's in there. I can let myself remember it at a conscious level, and it doesn't drive me crazy, and it doesn't overwhelm me, and it doesn't make me you know, cry incessantly. And the more I prove that to myself, the easier it gets to go do the, the work the next time, to do another worksheet or to listen to the feedback from somebody who's trying to tell me about my regulatory speech. Right. And so I, I strengthen, you know, Michael was frequently talking about these spiritual faculties. I literally strengthen my own spiritual faculties. I strengthen my core sense of my durability and my strength and resilience every time I face something that's scary and don't turn away and don't use a drug and and don't distract myself from it. So, right. that's all I wanted to talk about today. <laughs> cool. Well, my Can I bring for a minute? Let me... Let me add two things, and then I'll turn it over to Michael. Um, 
one thing you were talking about journaling, that's another step of taking it even to a deeper level, and that's what I do most of the time now is I have a journal book and I write to I, I write to Yahweh, but you can write to your higher self, to spirit or whoever. And I actually journal my worksheet. You know, this is what's in my face today, and this is what I feel, and, you know, this uh, is the goal that I hold. But I write it out like a letter to Yahweh, you know, and then I'll go back and reread. And, and so it's, it takes it, for me anyway, to an even deeper level to do it as a journal. And the other thing that I was uh, thinking of is another tool that we use that helps to go into that unconscious part, the part that we can't see, the things that we've hidden, is the mind shifters that we do. And it's a statement that we'll usually have a negative feeling or thought about. And it really, if you just sit and just keep writing and doing the mind shifter, it takes it to a a whole other level. And don't try to analyze it, just do a brain dump. And then go back and reread that, and then you get a whole lot of information that you need to do worksheets on. So before Michael takes over there, the call-in number is 646-200-4169. And if you're already on the switchboard, I know we had somebody yesterday and right at the closeout time, he writes in the chat room that he was waiting to be talked to. But if you don't hit one, I don't know that you want to talk. There's a lot of people on the switchboard. Most everybody's just sitting there re- uh, listening. So if you're wanting to speak to, to Michael, um, please press one on your phone and it'll Stick a little hand up and let me know that you want to talk. So, Michael, it's all yours. Yeah, actually, I don't want to take it over. I think you guys are doing a great job, and I'd like to keep listening. I just had a couple of thoughts when Tim finished, and uh, and that was to put into the equation that this habitual dissociation, this habitual denial and dissociation becomes addictive, and most people are addicted to managing their stress. That is what they don't want to look at by denial, holding the breath, and keeping those things hidden. And that's the energy that turns into all aberrant behavior, all hostility, all fear, all disease, physical, mental, emotional, all psychosis. All of those things are the result of being addicted to keeping things out of sight. And the the running in the background of the programs that, oh, I can't look at this, this is too painful. I mean, I love the way you put that together, Tim. Uh, This is too painful, can't deal with this, can't deal with that. Those programs running in the background use up a significant amount of our intelligence. You know, they say the older person, you know, gets kind of senile and forgetful, et cetera. I don't think they get senile. I don't think they get forgetful. I think what happens to most of them is that they're running so many protect programs, so many defense programs, so many attack programs in the background Instead of having a nine-bit mind, you know, there's some Harvard research, for those who haven't been listening in the past, some Harvard research that says that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells fire, 10,000 electrical units of of activity are going on, the max that can go into conscious awareness is that can be processed in in a time frame of about a 25th of a second is nine bits. Well, if somebody's using four, five, six bits to keep these attack, defense, got to protect myself, got to be safe, blah, blah, blah. You know, the the kid who's ADD, look at the the environment that they were brought up in and and count how many times they've been blindsided. They've got a background program going on that says, I need to keep looking in every direction all the time. I can't keep my focus anywhere too long or else I'll get blindsided. And and so this uses up intelligence and makes it look like learning disabled. It's it's the key to, uh, to so many things and the willingness to go into those places and find the recoup the power that's there is awesome. And and Tim, I just tapped into the show as you were talking about me stirring things up for people. I can't believe that that's true. I've never done that in my life. But anyway, <laughs> I would like to continue because I think your conversation's awesome, and I'd like to listen. Okay, well, are you all willing? <laughs> or did I learn? Yeah. And who's you guys? Where where are you? <laughs> we went on sabbatical when you came on the phone. <laughs> I, I started talking, but my mute button was on. Oh, okay. You got me now? We've okay, done that good. before. So, um, well, thank you. I'm glad you're, you're there. Um, did you hear what it was that you said in the video that was new that stirred things up for people? 
No, no, what was it? I, I just came in as you were t- at the tail end of that conversation, and I just went, I can't believe that's possible. I don't care what I, I, I – that's never happened before. Well, and there's your sarcasm. Pull out a worksheet. <laughs> there's your family sarcasm <laughs> jumping up again. So anyway, um, the newest version of the Why Again video, right? it got shipped in the wrong box. And it clearly hasn't been edited. So that's just a side note for you to, to uh-huh. check with the, the, the DVD people. Because okay. you actually, in this version of the video, you actually mention a product name. And then you say, oh, strike that. I shouldn't say a, a company name. Edit that out. And you take a moment and say, okay, edit that out. But there's another piece that should have been edited and it wasn't. And you had restarted the tape. So... That's a side note. But in that video, you mentioned that you'll start doing worksheets on things that cause you negative emotions. And eventually, you'll start doing worksheets about your happy times. <laughs> Do you remember saying that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That really triggered people in our discussion in the group. What is that? Non being mine goes nuts. Why would I have to do a worksheet about a good time in my life or about how somebody made me feel happy or about how I have a happy time with my wife or my husband? Or So that was the thing that stirred up so much. <laughs> that Jeannie, that, made, me, were, that ahead, made me think of during one of the intensives this summer, you know, Michael always in the workshop says to use a small issue or upset, you know, just not to use your major life issue. Well, during one of the intensives this summer, he told us to use a big major life issue. And you wouldn't believe that, I mean, everybody in the room, of course, we've all been into different workshops, and it's like, oh, you mean, well, what about, well, how can, well, what, what, I mean, it was just like on and on. It took like five minutes to just get that into people's heads, use a major issue, <laughs> doing something different. Yeah, yeah, challenge them. And, and it, it was a, a beautiful intro into the discussion in the group last night because I had to the energy was up so high I had to stop everybody and say please remember that if you're going to learn anything new you have to be willing to question everything you already think you know if you're holding on to what you already know nothing new can come in so it set the tone for the evening to just talk about questioning everything and then the nature of marriage and relationships in our world today because people are trying to defend. I mean, you you can only, I'm sure you can imagine because you've been in groups like this before, that when you question people's fundamental assumptions about the nature and value of relationship, rivets start popping on the side of the building. You know, it's the pressure and energy coming out was just amazing. So... I think Jeannie did an excellent job of explaining that essentially what you're you're, um, pointing to there is if I say in my mind or out loud anybody made me feel angry or sad, it's the same as saying anybody made me feel happy or glad or proud. And that's all dependent. I've created that codependent relationship in that heartbeat where I believe somebody else is responsible for what I'm experiencing internally. Uh, so that was a real powerful uh, move into the the group session, and and it, it was a, it was a wonderful evening. And of course, the next thing is, Jeannie was talking about journaling, and when I refer to the journaling these days, I call the mind shifter process. The other word I use for it is targeted journaling. Ah, that's good. And and one of the reasons I like Michael's approach and the mind shifter so much is that when you do research about how the mind works, it's very clear that my mind will only do what I tell it to do. So if I ask myself, why am I in such horrible relationships? my mind will give me a list of dozens of reasons, beliefs I hold about myself not being worthy, 
the need to go back and work out other bad relationships, the the way I open myself up for pain and sadness if I let myself get too happy, I will get a bunch of reasons or excuses and it will reinforce my current position. So rather than asking a question about something and then letting myself journal on it, which is to stir up the unconscious, Michael uses the approach that makes a positive statement And it says, I have an abundance of money. I always earn more than I can spend. Now, there's a positive statement, and it will resonate in my unconscious everything that wants to come out and fight against it. So rather than saying, why can't I make enough money? Or write out and let me journal on why my family history has always been to live in poverty rather than abundance. If I ask my mind to tell me that, it will give me all the reasons why that has to happen, why it's always been that way and why it needs to stay that way. So I really like the mind shifter process, and I call it the mind shifter, and then I call it targeted journaling because I specifically resonate in response to a positive statement about myself, my relationships, my life, my finances, my health, any aspect of my life, if I read, if I'm sorry, if I write down a positive statement and then let myself respond to it enough times, eventually any part of me that wants to refute it will bubble up and come out on the paper. And and it may not even always be a positive statement. The idea, by definition, a mind shifter is it's a thought about an issue in your life around which you have negative thoughts, and it's the opportunity to surface, process, and release the negative thoughts. So it won't necessarily be a positive idea, but the the idea in selecting a mind shifter for me is that you select one that holds a frequency that will cause whatever has been dissociated from to fire. So it might not necessarily be positive. Primarily, you know, most of the time it is, but not necessarily because it may take a different frequency. It may take a, a frequency that someone would call negative to get uh, you know, a particular issue to come to the surface. And that's why you really want to be tapped in intuitively when you're uh, you know, giving people mind shifters to really tap in. What's the vibration that's needed to bring up whatever it is this person needs to bring up and look at? When you, uh, when you talked about the... Um, uh, doing worksheets on wonderful things, and for the sake of those who are on the show, did you uh, did you tie it in with the near life experience uh, type of thing, uh, so that that whole idea makes more sense? No, no. Go ahead and expound so, on that. So I think that'd be a good place to uh, to uh, to expound. That it would uh, help to expand the understanding. First of all, when you were talking to him about, we have to be able to question everything. One of my favorite quotes from Einstein is he says, and, and you know, you, you put this in the context of here's probably the greatest scientific genius of all time, a man who says intuition is more important than knowledge. His work was 90% intuition, 10% knowledge. He came up with his general theory of relativity with no experimental equipment. It was during the war. I mean, the man is just amazing, and he didn't get it from his mind. He got it from his being. And what he says is, and so... So I think we can safely assume that Einstein has experienced the actual universe and he's trying to bring an understanding of it into our level of understanding, which is pretty primitive. So what he says about science of his day is this. He says, all science, when compared with actuality, is primitive and childlike. So Einstein says, folks, My theory of relativity is primitive and childlike. Like, folks, we haven't even started to approximate the truth yet. We haven't even started to get to the experience, which, you know, when I think of him talking about that, I think about the scriptural idea that says the mind of man has not yet conceived of what lies in store. What we could be doing, we can't even start to fathom what the world would look like if we all woke up as human beings. But that idea of you start doing worksheets around the wonderful things, the positive things, because people can get trapped in a, in a circumstance where they're off looking to replicate 
a positive experience from the past. Well, let's see, you know, I remember back in 1982 and I had this wonderful, and let me go see if I can find somebody to create that experience with again. Well, if I go find somebody to create that experience again, what am I doing? I'm firing brain cells from 1982, and I'm reliving a reality from 1982. By definition, if I'm living a reality from 1982, I'm dead in 2011. The idea of this work is to bring people to life, not to get them where their mind only outputs wonderful, positive, happy things. That's not the idea. The idea is to be with what's actually there and to begin to transform so that What's going on in the mind no longer controls us, good, bad, or indifferent, to get to the point where what's in the mind is just what's in the mind. It's neutral. It's like, and to really, truly live a human life, you've got to be out of your mind. You can't function out of that thing. So if you look at what the world calls, and of course, as usual, the world's got it all backward, the world calls it a near-death experience. Well, actually, most people in this culture are dead by the age of four. That's my experience. And being dead by the age of four, if someone goes through what the world calls a near-death experience, that is their body goes through what's called clinical death, all of a sudden, for the first time in their lives, that rattle-trap mind is shut up because it's clinically dead. It can't function. It can't output anything. And this being now has a direct experience of a human life, the awesome presence of love. They get to experience who they are. Then, if their physiology recuperates, if they're able to bring them out of clinical death, get the heart going again, get the blood to the brain, and things start to function again, they come back and they've had a near-life experience. The idea is to experience our lives out of our eternal being and, and experience it as life, not just replicating something from the past, something going on in the body's mind. And that's all the body's mind can do, good, bad, or indifferent, is replicate, replicate, replicate. Whereas if we get to the point of experiencing out of being, then, and, and one of the ways to do that is to have a near-death experience or what's really a near-life experience, the world calls it near-death. But you don't have to have a near-death experience to get to where you actually live a true human life. You do have to collapse the output of your mind a sufficient number of times until you wake up to who you are. And that's what forgiveness does. Each time you forgive, you collapse the output of the replicate mind, and it shuts up. And when it shuts up, all of a sudden, you get to experience who you are as a human being, and you get to play the real game of life. Aliveness, conscious creation, the absolute awesome presence of a human life, love, creatorship, 24-7, 365, and it's an awesome thing to do. And it's fun. It's more fun than all the drama and trauma and pain and diseases and rage and fear and insisting that everybody else be the good guy while I'm being an SOB. It's, it's a lot more fun than any of that. <laughs> and so, so that would be the other piece to me of why you would do things, worksheets on what one calls wonderful experiences. Powerful stuff. It's definitely a wake-up call. It's, it's definitely. And to me, when you recognize that 2,000 years ago, this guy named Yeshua had the technology and the understanding of how to have a near-life experience without going through clinical death, and, and that it was disappeared is just, I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And, and, and it's it makes it so much more fun. Right, but it's also, as we were talking about yesterday, so wonderful that it wasn't completely eliminated and that the absolute truth can't ever be completely eliminated and that now, in our current time, we have the benefit of the Internet and other technologies that facilitate the spreading of these tools and the community that we can develop with other people to help help them apply the tools and help ourselves apply the tools. So it's quite optimistic. It's like Ian Lunghold said, time isn't speeding up, but creation is speeding up. And since we are creators 
and now we have new tools for spreading what we're able to create, we can create on the on the positive side, on the love side of things, as opposed to the anger and fear side of things. You just reminded me, Tim, I, I saw a uh, a piece. I was booting up a computer. I've been having some problems with my computer. I was booting it up, and it just went through, a, and, and uh, I think it was on MSN. And uh, they had a, uh, a scientific article on the fact that the universe is speeding up. I didn't have the space because I've been having computer problems to, to follow that up but it might be interesting to Google and see what they're saying about uh, uh, the universe speeding up. Well, I think what what you might be referring to is that scientists have discovered that instead of their original theory about the Big Bang, that there was this explosion from a point and the creation of matter, which then was expanding away from the center, and that because it had an initial energetic explosion and nothing to drive it after that, that the expansion was slowing down, and theoretically it would get to the point where it quit expanding and started to collapse with the force of gravity back upon itself and then eventually implode into nothing. That's the theory behind the Big Bang. What they're discovering now is that the universe and the expansion of matter away from other matter is accelerating. So it contradicts an extension of the theory of the Big Bang and that somehow dark matter is responsible for the expansion of the universe rather than just the impetus of the first explosion at the Big Bang. So that the movement of galaxies away from each other is not slowing down and reversing, it's actually accelerating. That's probably what you were hearing about, because that was a a news article in uh, National Public Radio this past week. Good stuff. Yeah, so that that could that, that could help you narrow your search. That that it's that that's probably what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I would love for you guys to continue your conversation. I was enjoying it before I so rudely interrupted. <laughs> well, you got about uh, twelve minutes left. Is there anything going on in the chat room, Jeannie? No, there's not. Every there's um, not very many people out there today, and uh, just being real quiet. Everybody that's on the switchboard, if you have a question, press 1, and we'll turn you on and let you talk. Um, but anyway, until then, one of the things I was thinking about when we talked about uh, shutting down and, and denying what's going on, it reminded me of, you know, I'm back in college and I'm taking psychology. I'm getting my degree in psychology. And right now we're discussing abnormal psychology, and it's all different, you know, schizophrenia and, and everything. Well, one of the discussions this past week was on alcoholism. And so I put in there, you know, that alcohol is a way of, of, it's a choice, a drug of choice to not have to look at or deal with what's going on inside. And I admitted that there was, you know, certain uh, people and and races that could be, have a genetic inclination uh, towards being an, an alcoholic, you know, that they would like you know, Native Americans, their uh, genetic makeup, they can't um, handle the intoxicating effects as well as some other races, you know, and that there are, you know, some things going on, but that ultimately it is a choice, that it, alcoholism is not a disease, it's a choice. And uh, this one student wrote back to me, and I mean, their whole, the first two paragraphs was basically that um, all of the, the statistics that prove that, you know, all of these genes that make somebody predispositioned, you know, to alcohol and that, you know, yeah, they have the choice to pick up the first drink, but once they've taken the first drink that it takes over and then they don't have a choice and and all of this other. And and just their whole article, the first thing that popped in my mind was they've been an alcoholic. Well, I get down to the last paragraph and and they sure enough say that they've been sober, sober for 17 years. And so it was like all of this, you could hear the pain and the, the disillusionment in what they were writing, that they didn't want to believe that it wasn't something that they didn't have a choice over, that it, you know, they wanted to believe 
that it just took over and that they didn't have a choice and that it was because of their genes and because of their, and it's the same thing as everything else that we've been talking about, you know, wanting to blame somebody else. So it's real easy for this person to say, oh, well, I have this B gene and I've got this and this is wrong and, you know, so I couldn't help it and, you know, but I've overcome it, but, you know, I can't help it and it it takes over if I don't pay attention and, and all this other. So it's sort of that same concept of blaming something outside of us instead of taking responsibility and saying, hey, you know, I can make a difference here. I can make a change. Yeah, that's a, there's a, a big debate that as, as most things in our culture are driven by power, money, politics. And third party pay. Yeah, and, and what you're looking at here is an entire system that's been developed around having labeled something as a disease and then right. certifying people who are specifically trained to identify and then treat that disease. And so you have enormous systems that are making millions, if not billions of dollars because in order to be licensed by a state, you have to take this course and you have to agree with these premises and you have to take that certification and prove and make statements that you believe it happens this way and this is the cause and this is the only cure. And so there's a lot of money and there is a lot of uh, people's careers that are invested in calling something a disease. Absolutely. And so, you know, if you're going to get certified as an alcoholism counselor in most states, you have to read and be conditioned to believe and take on the conditioning that says this is a disease, these people can't help it, I have to be an outside treatment agent to help them to fix this, to deal with this lifelong problem, it's incurable, et cetera. And then, and then and only then will the state give me a license so that insurance companies can reimburse me, so that doctors can write prescriptions based on my, you know, it, it's a vicious cycle. But as you're talking right. about it, anybody who's worked in the field for any length of time who isn't completely overcome by the conditioning, they understand there are certain people who after years and years of drinking, whether it's obsessively or compulsively or daily or to excess, they all of a sudden one day say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And they never drink again, and they don't use the treatment programs, and they don't use AA, and they don't use support. And then there are other people who, despite an intense and extensive history of alcoholism and drug abuse in their family, They grow up and they they never drink. They don't have any interest or they're turned away from it because of all of the pain and problems they've seen in their family. So if there is this disease process and it is inevitable if you have these genes and it is a disease that can only be cured by outside intervention, how do you explain that with all of these what they would call statistically outliers, these people and these situations that deviate so dramatically from the theory. Well, what happens most of the time in these situations is people ignore the outliers. It's the same thing that happens in cancer treatment. When you have a whole range of people who have spontaneous remission or people who go to change their diet and exercise and do energy work or forgiveness worksheets and all of a sudden their tumor disappears, they ignore that. They don't start looking for what's the possible connection between these activities or this change of diet or this release of emotional energy and the disappearance of the tumor. They just take those people out of their studies and then they don't have to explain it. Right, exactly. And we do have a caller. I think it's Julie. Um, We've got a few minutes. Hi, Julie. (laughs) Hey, Jeannie. I actually uh, shut the uh, phone. Um, connection off. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so what, what I was hearing everything that you were saying, and I found it very interesting. And of course, I, I, I guess I have to realize, or my, from my take, is that we're all conditioned 
you know, to believe in that victimhood role. And we, we you know, in my past, my worksheets have always been around um, conditioning, some sort of, uh, I've got some noise in the back. Can you hear that too? Yeah, we can. That's okay. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say that I think that we need to come um, from a space of realizing that we, as a culture we've been conditioned to believe in the victimhood um, realities and, and conditioned to believe that this is the way things are. And so then we, we step into that and then we, we play it out. And um, I don't think it's something that's intentionally done. I just think it's kind of like a state of unconsciousness. And the state that once we start doing our forgiveness, we can realize that we can step out of that role. Right. So, so when, you're, kind of, when you're when you're helping someone with a worksheet and and say that they were in total denial like that, how would you get them to at least question that you know they're not the victim in this situation that they have a choice in it? Well, most of the time when I'm working with people, they are quite willing to take a look at their participation in their life. They they are usually in a place where they're feeling some degree of feedback, which was pain, and so that they're willing to just participate in that. And I just like to come from a space of compassion, realizing that, you know, they're conditioned to believe about you know, well, this is the world is real, and they're conditioned to believe in certain things, and then I just need to have a space of um, compassion and love for them as they begin to do their worksheet process and, you know, create a different outcome, a different goal. Right. Well, I didn't, uh, I haven't responded back to this student yet on what they were saying, but one of the things they said was, oh, I didn't have any pain. I just drank just because. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that yeah, I, I think that they're just out of touch with what was really going on for them. You know, they were they were caught in a, you know, like an energy field, and they just kept doing a behavior. And because the goal supported that behavior, they just kept doing that. And so whatever, right. you know, they just like, like kind of trapped into a cycle. And so, you know, they they're probably be in denial of their pain because, you know, the alcohol probably took over, you know, for them with their pain. You know, right. so they, they were probably just kind of in a state of denial that they had anything, you know, going on as far as pain went. Okay. And then they'll, and since they believe in victimhood, you know, they they created, um, you know, them feeling like the alcohol had power over them instead of them feeling like they have power over the alcohol. They have choice. They didn't feel like they had choice. Right. So I think it's kind of like stuck in a cycle. A repetitive okay. cycle, and you know, and then, yeah, and also it, it takes a degree of maturity to say, "Oh, hey, you know, um, there's some truth to what you're saying, Jeannie." You know, it, you know, sometimes um, one has to actually question what was going on rather than, you know, continuing the same behavior. Right. Yeah, that kind of goes back to what Tim was saying in the beginning of the show about you know having to question everything that you think you believe and to be able to say, you know, is this true or not. Right, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your input. Oh, you're welcome. I had to race up the hill to get away from that that sound, so I seem to be a little bit out of breath, but that's why I wanted to just be able to communicate that. I think coming from a place of compassion, realizing that we're conditioned into this culture and that we're conditioned into that victimhood, and then being able to say, okay, let me embrace you. You know, you've been conditioned, and I, I am getting out of that conditioning and I have an, a new a new awareness that I want to share with you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Love you. Love you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Julie. So we're, so we're down to about 55 seconds. And uh, so we want to just thank everybody for joining us today and bring somebody new with you tomorrow. Uh, we are now able to broadcast on different radio stations. You can go to our website and pick that up. So it's expanding, so we just need to get more people to listen. So thank you for joining us, and we hope you have the best year yet of your eternal life. Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice and his wife, Jeannie, who present the internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday 
from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.yagain.com. That's www.whyagain.com. 